Thank you, thank you. And um, thank you, Indra, for setting a very low bar of staying awake. So uh, I hope we can meet that. Um, yeah, look, thanks for giving me the chance to speak here and to do uh, what I think is probably the most interesting part, like Indra, which is to introduce some people who are actually out there doing the real thing. Um, as Indra said, uh, I used to be, or still am, a civil servant in the Department of Health and Social Care. I'm now a civil servant in NHSX, and we're trying to work out what that means for us all. But um, at the core of it, and the thing that we've been working on probably for the last year or so, is to try and create a health and care system that helps innovators like the four that you're about to see uh, to, to support us to meet the needs um, and use the most innovative tech in order to do that. So, um, you know, as a system, we're looking at how we can make it easier for people who've proven that they're meeting a need, that they're doing something that helps us as the system, as patients, as users, as clinicians, um, and take it and roll it out. You know, it shouldn't be like the old traveling salesman with your thing in a briefcase rocking up at all of the... Uh, all of the trust and trying to flog your thing over and over again. You know, the system should be ready to promulgate good innovation. So some of the things we're trying to do at NHSX to support that are, you know, be hard on standards, try and shift the system to a kind of standardized uh, mode so that if something works somewhere, the kind of technicalities of rolling it out become much easier. And we're looking at, you know, hard levers that we have in that space around spend controls. Can we get in and uh, see what people are buying and, and make sure that it meets our standards and that it, it makes the kind of rolling out of innovation um, easier? Now, we're also looking at softer measures, like how can we support the people in the regions to understand what it is that they need and what it is that they're buying? Um, can we put in place procurement frameworks? Can we, you know, train people up? So we're coming at it from a two-pronged attack, which is that we're no longer going to stand by while you buy things that make it difficult for us to innovate or, um, you know, accept innovation into the system. Um, but we're also going to hopefully put in place some, some support so that we're not just beating people um, with a stick. Um, and, you know, as I say, very happy to be here and to introduce the, the four teams that you're going to see now um, because this is kind of what it's all about, you know. It's about using the latest technology to transform health and care and our job in the centre is to make it easier for the really smart people like yourselves and like these four to, uh, to come and do that for us. And um, I'm always in awe when I meet people like these because I wish I had the balls to kind of do something like that myself. But I don't. I'll sit in the centre and, uh, and shuffle paper and do policy and hopefully uh, something will happen. So we have four uh, innovations, innovators that you're going to hear from. Um, they're each going to speak about their thing for about 10 minutes. And then at the end of it, um, hopefully we'll have some Q&A. Hopefully some of you might have some questions. Um, we don't have microphones, so you'll just have to stand up and shout, and then I'll repeat it if people can't hear. Um, so we have uh, Nick Watkins and Andy Gray from Cortical. Here they are. They're going to show us uh, an application of AI in uh, blood supply um, and demand planning. Sorry, Nick is actually from NHS Blood and Transplant. We will then have Emma Hughes from Alder Hay Children's Hospital, who's the head of innovation there, and is going to show us an AI virtual assistant. Piers Keane uh, from Moorfield to show us AI in diagnostic eye disease. And Jacqueline Moxon from MRAD, uh, AI in breast screening. But first up, as I've said, Nick and Andy. Thank you. Thanks. So yes, you have a double act, so we're going to try and keep this to 10 minutes between us. Um, what I've said to Andy is if I go over, he has to truncate his bit of the presentation. Um, so I'm from NHS Blood and Transplant, Andy's from Cortical. I'm going to set out the problem that we have as an organisation, and Andy's going to talk a little bit about the solution that um, Cortical are working on. So NHS Blood and Transplant, our primary role around blood donation is to collect blood from blood donors process that using standardised processes and distribute it to hospitals. We distribute blood to all hospitals within England. We collect about 1.1.5 million donations each year from about a million different donors. And we're looking at how we can use AI and advanced analytics in a number of areas as an organisation. 
So we're looking at it around, can we predict donor behavior? Can we look at it around, can we understand the impact of donation on individual donors on their health? And the area that we're going to talk about today is, can we look at intelligent process design in terms of making our organization more efficient? <clears throat> So I'm going to focus specifically on platelets. So platelets, these are life-saving donations. They go to patients who um, have a very low platelet count. They may be having chemotherapy. They may have had uh, traumatic injury. Essentially, this stops them bleeding out. Um, we have two ways in which we collect platelets. One's called apheresis. One's called pooled. You don't really need to know about those. We hold roughly about a day of stock of platelets at any one time. And we take those donations and we process them into about 128 different types of product that hospitals in England can order. Um, they have a one week shelf life, so they're high value, uh, short shelf life products that we need to maximize the use of that donation to make sure that wastage in that system is as, is as low as it can be. Average demand on a daily basis is about 695 units, and that goes to 248 hospitals in England. We, don't, we used to distribute blood to North Wales, but the Welsh have taken that back. Um, so there's a the Welsh blood service, a Scottish blood service, with the English blood service. And it's not working, that's because I'm not holding up. So the project that um, we're working on with Cortical, and this is a true collaboration, we started off with a number of pilot studies which showed that we could work with Andy and his team at Cortical. And then we applied to Innovate UK for funding for a project uh, to, to essentially trans digital transformation project. So what the work that we're talking about is funded by Innovate UK. It's not funded by us as an organization, but it's funded by the UK government through Innovate UK. And it's looking at whether we can improve the platelet supply chain. So this, the graph on the uh, right as you look at it, I'm not sure whether you can see it, but that shows the variation in platelet demand that there is within a particular hospital. So on one day they can be ordering 12 units of platelets, on another day they're ordering 70 units of platelets. So we're seeing quite a large fluctuation in use of platelets in hospitals. And at the moment we have no way of looking at data within hospitals. So we're not predicting our collections on the basis of anything that's happening within the hospital other than the orders that they're placing. So we're interested in terms of this project, whether we can better predict demand, uh, whether we can integrate hospital data, uh, and then whether we can better understand how we're currently operating. And Andy's team at Cortical, they have some skills and a skill set that we can't put towards this problem within NHSBT. It's hard for us to attract the type of expertise that a company like Cortical have. And so I'm going to hand over to Andy and he's going to talk about this solution. Thanks, Nick. All right. So. <clears throat> Sorry. So we're going to talk about using artificial intelligence and machine learning to actually uh, improve the demand planning. And so the scope of this is uh, trying to do it for the blood supply chain, as, as Nick talked about. And it's really going from donor. So you know, when people give blood at a donor center, uh, you know, you've got the platelets only survive for seven days. So you've got to get that through all manufacturing, uh, all of the testing, back out through the distribution, back out to the hospitals. So it's really sort of you know, seven days is a very short time span to have all that happen. Make sure that you've got all the blood products in in all the right place. And so um, the, the focus is on platelets, especially because they are that sort of high value, uh, short shelf life product. And uh, it's, so the scope is national as well. So it's across all the, the stockholding units, feeding into all the hospitals um, from all the donor centers. And then as part of the next phase, uh, we're going to look at going into some of the hospitals and actually showing what the value increase we can expect if we can get that hospital data, improve the predictions, and then drive that through. So the targets for success are a 50% reduction in waste and a 50% reduction in the ad hoc transport costs, which we're going to touch on in a little bit. And um, you know, this is quite an ambitious project because from, from when we receive data to actually going live in, in August, that's a six month window. And then we've also got the, you know, we're going to, to go with the hospital data then in, in March following that. And um, so when we're looking at the problem here, you can see this is, you know, the donor center. So this is where, you know, all the different people who do the collections. Then it goes to these stockholding units, which are basically sort of where we collect all of that blood up, and then it goes into the different manufacturing sites, and then it goes back out to all of the different stockholding units. And um, obviously, we've got to try to figure out, you know, with, you know, is it A negative, A positive, you know, wh where are all those bloods going to ride? Is it CMV neg? So there's lots of different ways that you can have all of these products, and it's a case of that we need all of that demand in the right place. Uh, but unfortunately, despite the fact that NHS already do 
quite sophisticated modeling. Uh, you know, they're using uh, linear regressions and, and all these sorts of things to try to get that demand predicted correctly. They end up having to shuffle around a lot of the supply that they already get to the stock holding units so that um, you know, the, the, it is the, where it needs to be. And obviously, these ad hoc movements, as they're called, they can be quite costly as well. So the, the two big things that you get is, you know, obviously, if it's in the wrong place, it doesn't get used. You've got those expiries. And then if you have to move it, then you've got the cost for the ad hoc movements. Oh. So we're missing some slides. <laughs> OK, so, um, so yeah, so basically, like, what, what I uh, imagine my diagram. <laughs> So basically, like what we've got is um, when you're trying to do the predictive modeling. So you need to basically be able to figure out like who's going to come in. Uh, so you know where you know where uh, what donors are likely to show up. What who what blood are you going to have to create the platelets from? And then you also then have to do the modeling around each of the hospitals uh, where that blood is going to go. Basically, then if you're looking at the patients, you need to predict what procedures are going to happen. So there's actually like a, a large amount of modeling that you need to do to for, for this because uh, it's quite a complex supply chain. And then you've got all the logistical movements that you need to model as well. So. By using uh, our technology, we're able to actually um, do uh, automate a lot of that sort of creation of the deep neural networks and the XG boost and the other algorithms that you might have. And so we're able to build out models very, very quickly to, uh, to solve a lot of these different problems. So thank you very much. The presentation isn't supposed to end there. Andy's got two great slides where he's showing how his company are presenting the data back to us. So essentially at the moment, uh, we, uh, we operate on spreadsheets. We've got an SO99 um, process. It's very manual. And what the team at Cortical are building is something that's much more automated. And essentially it gives you the next, next best action um, as a result of it. So he's taking all of our data, uh, integrating it in their automated system um, called the core, building models on that. And they're currently... Our initial estimates are, with, with the first cut of the model, there's between, well, it depends on the different type of platelet, but there's between sort of four, about 15.5% saving or average sort of improvement in their forecast compared to what we're currently doing. Um, and we think that will get better as we start adding hospital data. Because you can imagine if a, if a surgeon orders a blood test and you get a low platelet count, there's a likelihood that that patient is going to go on to require a platelet transfusion. And we can't see any of that data yet, and that will be phase two of this work. So I have to apologise. Um, there were a couple more slides. In there. <laughs> no, no, we, we apologise to you. So sorry that uh, your slides weren't there, but thank you. Thank no, you very much. much. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right, OK, so as I said, we'll <laughs> rattle through the presentations, and then we'll come for questions at the end. So next up, Emma Hughes from Alderhey Children's Hospital, Head of Innovation at Alderhey Children's Hospital. Thank you, Emma. Hi, um, good afternoon. Um, as I said, I, I work in the innovation department at Alderhey. We actually have a um, dedicated innovation hub um, where we, our vision and our mission is really to have impact with innovation. We heard some speakers earlier today around how do we actually take the technology that's being done, get this staff engagement and deploy it within a hospital setting. That's really our mission around we're working from the start in terms of what are the healthcare challenges, um, what are the needs of the staff and the patients, and obviously it's very patient driven, but also to get some of innovation having impact, we, we really do need to engage the staff from the very beginning. And so our innovation department is working on a program of um, identifying needs, needs and challenges from within the hospital. Now, again, one of our um, first projects we started um, probably back in 2016 was the use of artificial intelligence for patient experience. Um, we believe it's the first um, hospital setting use case of AI for patient experience. It's basically a virtual assistant, a conversation service, which was answering basic questions around the hospital um, for hospital visits, pre-op, pre um, post-op information. Um, we started as a generic um, set of, of, of information, and we're also then developing into specific knowledge domains. So, for example, looking at muscular dystrophy or looking at head injury. Um, so we've actually wanted to provide relevant information at the point of need for, for patients and their family. 
um, and that it's reliable information. So what we've actually done is we're creating its new data. So we've worked a lot, again, very much around going back to kind of code of conduct, engaging the, the patients and the staff around what is the information that they both need um, at and um, they are based on questions that we've worked through with all of the different departments. And then we've answered those questions. They're clinically validated or operationally validated around the hospital. Um, the other reason for working on this AI project wasn't just around can we deploy AI. Um, it was also looking about building the knowledge and capabilities within Older Hay itself. Um, again, looking at the future of innovation in healthcare, um, we recognise that we want to collaborate with external partners and, and companies, but we also need to build a capability internally and understand what, what we're going to require from resources to actually then deploy the solutions. So this project has been kind of, um, kind of multifaceted in terms of actually solving a problem around providing that information and um, the point of need to, to patients and families, but also about un as understanding how do you actually go ahead and de deploy this within a hospital setting. So our partners for this are the Science Techn Technology Facilities Council um, Hartree um, Lab in Diasbury, and it's utilising um, IBM Watson. So we worked with them, um, as I said, going back in 2016, they were actually part of the understanding the needs from the staff and the patients. Um, we looked at how does the technology actually match that, ch um, that challenge. Um, so we looked at how we use the IBM Watson conversation service, what would need to be done to that. Again, this is a very collaborative approach. We, you know, we engage in a collaboration agreement. We were both kind of putting in, putting skin in the game at this stage because, again, this this Watson platform hadn't been used within a hospital setting or within a patient experience. So what we've learned from this is that it's not just about the technology. What Alder Hay brings to this is, you know, real clinical utility. How can it be properly deployed? How do we, how do we do the, the question gathering? How do we answer it um, in, the, in the appropriate ways? And how do we do all that within, within the structure and governance of, and regulations within a hospital? Um, so they've been on a, on a journey with us and they, they've been bringing obviously a lot of the technical knowledge um, and we've, it's been a very iterative process. What we tried to do though we, is that we looked at, in addition to the technology, um, and again this is, was mentioned earlier today, it's really important we understand how this is actually valuable. Um, so we took a number of kind of assumptions and objectives of the project that we, we needed to deliver on was, you know, can we actually deliver this within a hospital context? And actually, we've shown we can. We've got a minimal viable product. It's out there. It's available on our intranet. We're sending it. It's available through our um, patients' engagement app, um, Older Play. And it answers questions um, about, you know, kind of pre-op or pre-assessment or general hospital information, anything from where's the parking to does, do, does a blood test hurt? So... From an MVP, we, we've, we've ticked that box. The other thing is, though, but can it really support and enhance patient experience? So again, it's been a very iterative process around the technology, but we've also engaged on a regular basis with kind of user evaluations. And users, again, patients, staff, families, we have an internal guidance group. Um, and we've also got additional um, evaluations going on in terms of, um, you know, as we develop the technology, does it, does it still work? How do we enhance it? And again, it's completely iterative and collaborative. The other thing that obviously is critical within this is are we making sure that we can deploy a virtual assistant within the governance and, and the regulations standards? So again, we've got a multidisciplinary project team. Um, we've engaged, uh, part of the team is a clinical data safety officer, who's one of our consultants. Um, we work very closely with the information governance. We completed a, a DPIA. Um, and we are looking at the ongoing and emerging um, regulations and we're working to that. One of the things with where we started with this is it's quite, you know, we try, took the lower risk model in that it, this is not a diagnostic tool. This is about patient experience. But as I said, we're building a capability around an understanding how, how AI can be used in a hospital setting. So what we've been doing is working within the frameworks and the structure under the code of conduct that enables us, as we grow this uh, virtual assistant, you know, long term, we'd like it to be more personalized. At the moment, it's, there's no personal data in there. 
we already have that framework agreed. We've got that you know, data security, data infrastructure um, set up. In addition to that, um, we've also got to make sure that we are bringing tangible benefits to the hospital. So it's not just about the patients, but also how, how is this going to be sustainable? Um, you know, and generally that means it's got to be, there's got to be some resource or financial benefits. So we're working with um, procurements and we're working with different departments looking at how, you know, where there's actual value in this um, going forward. And, uh, and I think the other thing that's really important as part of our, our project is we're actually looking about how do we make this a sustainable solution in terms of looking at ongoing resources, requirements of it actually to be deployed. And part of that exercise is we actually now have three other hospitals who have agreed to work with us to be early adopters. So again, it's, it's going back to that, how do we actually embed new technology and innovation? How do we get it adopted and deployed? It, it's about really working very closely with the, with the front line, with the clinicians, with the other trusts, with the other hospitals to, to build that confidence. And, and as you probably can hear, going through some of those project assumptions mixed into that were a lot of actually the, the kind of code of conduct, the principles from the code of conduct that's um, just been released. So we, you know, I won't go through them all at the moment, but um, you know, again, just touching on making sure that we are engaging staff and, and patients. We're looking at how the new data set is being created, understanding you know, the, the DPIA and IG compliances. We're making sure we're you know, thinking about onboarding um, and also working very closely in terms of different, different guidelines, the NICE guidelines. And, um, and I think also the, the other piece of it is we've got this team that also includes a commercial I, in terms of we have to be sustainable as the NHS, innovation isn't going to run on its, on its own. So again, it's looking at how, how do we deploy this, how do we become sustainable and what are the, you know, the interesting business models that we can create as, as part of this, this process. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, and uh, thank you for the nod to the Code of Conduct, which uh, Indra, Jess and Tina are all uh, instrumental in delivering. I'm going to assume that they didn't pay you to put a whole slide in there about it, but we can talk about it later. Okay, next up, um, Piers Keen to talk about uh, AI in diagnostic eye disease at Moorfields. Thank you. Um, well, um, I, I mean, it's fantastic to be here. I, I'd like to thank Indra for uh, inviting me to speak. And uh, I have to say, Indra, that your, your motto of getting shit done is one that really resonates with me. So um, I, I hope that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, we can really develop the links with NHSX and, and really try and kind of, um, you know, uh, transform the way we do things in healthcare. So I'm, I'm going to speak about the collaboration between Moorfields Eye Hospital, where I'm a consultant, and uh, DeepMind. Um, and the idea is to use AI to, to reinvent the eye examination. And um, this is just my financial disclosure just to start. I think the most important thing to say is that I am paid as a consultant by DeepMind. So although I sort of think that DeepMind are great and I think the culture and the ethos of DeepMind is, is something that is very much in line with uh, the, the values of Moorfields, um, I do have that financial bias. So I, I want to declare that. Um, so this is a collaboration that I think, um, you know, at least some of you will have heard about. It was a collaboration that we, we announced in sort of mid-2016. and. Um, I had actually contacted DeepMind, I, I think in about July 2015, and I'd contacted Mustafa Suleiman from DeepMind and basically sent him a message on LinkedIn and said, you know, hi, I'm a consultant at Moorfields. We're doing X thousand uh, retinal scans per day, per week at Moorfields. There are people who are losing sight uh, irreversibly because they can't get seen and treated by an ophthalmologist quickly enough. We should work together to apply deep learning to triaging these OCT scans. And so that led to this announcement. And one of the things that I, I want to highlight to everybody here, which I think that even for the, for the doctors here, uh, or the non-ophthalmologists here, and maybe even for some ophthalmologists that you may not be aware of, is that ophthalmology is not a small specialty in the NHS, and not a small specialty around the world. In fact, 
in 2017, NHS Digital re released statistics that ophthalmology overtook orthopedics as the number one medical specialty in, across the NHS in terms of outpatient appointments. And so actually, nearly 10% of all uh, NHS outpatient appointments are for eyes. And that number has been going up by a lot recently, and we are drowning in the number of referrals that we get. And that is getting worse and worse. So th I say that because I just want to convey the imperative that we needed to do something, and we need to do something like this, whether it's with DeepMind or with others. Um, so, you know, I uh, initiated that collaboration in 2015, 2016, and then that, there followed a phase where I, was, I had a chance to sort of talk about the collaboration, and I found myself getting inv invited to events in the healthcare world, in the tech world, to talk about it. But what was slightly awkward was that we hadn't actually published any results. I couldn't talk about what we'd achieved. And so it was finally, a, it was a great relief then in August and September of 2018 when we, oh, when we published the results, uh, the first proof of concept results of the collaboration in the journal Nature Medicine. And so, uh, for, you know, Nature Medicine, as you'll be aware, is, is one of the world's leading uh, journals. It's the number one journal for translational medicine uh, in the world. And what I want to highlight there is there's 34 different co-authors on this paper. And there's lots of consultants from more fields, uh, senior scientists from UCL, and scientists from, uh, from DeepMind. So this was really a, a really strong, meaningful research collaboration. And it was very much not the case of going, here's our data, come back to us when you've solved the problem. Now, it was also a great honor that it was featured on, in the cover of Nature Medicine. And of course, this being AI, you cannot escape the hype around it. And so you had things like this, cover of the Evening Standard, uh, computer diagnosis could save the sight of millions. And you can imagine how exciting it was after all the hard work to see something like that. And you can imagine how much my, like, my mother was like sharing this on Facebook and like telling all the relatives how great her son was and all of those things, which was great, but also a little bit awkward. Because let me tell you, just to be clear, we have not saved the sight of a single person yet. What we've done is done proof of concept results to show that this is, you know, has great, great potential for the future. But actually, what I've come to learn is that the research paper is only kind of like one small step. And actually, translating into clinical practice is a big journey ahead of us. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that. We can deal with it in the questions and answers also. But what did we do? Well, we created this, this um, novel kind of deep learning architecture that consisted of two neural networks. So what we start is, we f on the left, we feed in a raw OCT scan. So an OCT scan is optical coherence tomography. It's like ultrasound, but uses light instead of sound waves and gives us really high resolution images of the retina and of the eye, like order of magnitude higher than an MRI scanner or a CT scanner. So we feed in a raw OCT scan into, a neural, into two neural networks in series. The first neural network segments the images. So actually we've trained it to delineate all the disease features on the scans. And that then creates this kind of tissue representation of the pathology that's going on. And that's fed into a second neural network, which is a classification network, which we've trained with disease labels. So we say, this is age-related macular degeneration, this is a macular hole, this is diabetic eye disease. We train it with thousands of those labels. And then ultimately, what it spits out is two things. It spits out a referral suggestion. So we'll say urgent referral, you know, semi-urgent referral, routine referral. And it will spit out a class, it will diagnose what's on the scan. So it will look at 10 different features that we would expect a retina specialist or consultant ophthalmologist to say, this is present, drusen, geographic atrophy, all these things that probably mean nothing to most people in the room, but are very exciting for someone like me. Um, and we use three-dimensional uh, UNET models for this. Now, as a byproduct of the way that we've set this up, the first neural network produces a ton of quantitative information. So it's not just that this can diagnose or triage, triage what's going on, it can measure the amount of uh, leakage of fluid into the eye, the bleeding, the scarring, and a lot of other information that is, let me tell you, not available at all to ophthalmologists uh, currently. So we essentially look at the scan and go, better, worse, 
kind of uh, assessment, but we get much more numbers on that. The other thing to say is that we've trained it with more than 50 different retinal diseases. So we've trained it with everything that comes to Moorfields, except in the case of very rare diseases where suppose you're the only person at Moorfields with disease X, then we wouldn't transfer that because we didn't want to, because we're dealing with anonymized data and we, we want to avoid the risk of re-identification if you're the only person with a certain disease. Here's an example of the prototype viewer. This is a patient with diabetes, guy in his 40s, poorly controlled diabetes. And what you can see there is that it's segmenting, and it's a bit hard for me to talk you through it in, in this setting, but what it's doing is it's segmenting the, the edema of the retina. And uh, then it's saying this is macular edema, and it's saying semi-urgent referral. Now, my last couple of slides now, um, before they drag me off, um, is to say, well, we've created this model and we wanted to evaluate its performance. So we got 1,000 new patients that presented to Morfields that had an OCT scan done at first presentation that had never, that the algorithm had never been exposed to in the training. And we ran the algorithm on that independent test set and we looked at its output on the referral suggestion. And so what it got was that, and lower is better here, it had a 5.5% error rate on the referral suggestion. We then got eight human specialists. So we got experts one to four who are consultant ophthalmologists at Moorfields, who are retina specialists, who are world famous experts in diagnosing retinal disease, and experts five to eight who are optometrists who work at Moorfields who have some experience in, in looking at these things. And how did it do against those experts? Well, it did very well. In fact, it did better than all eight experts except for the top two, which it did better than, but it wasn't statistically significantly different. Now, however, it's not fair to the retina specialists or to the humans, and I would urge you to be cautious whenever you hear the hype around superhuman performance with AI, because a lot of the time you find that the, the humans are doing something that they don't do in, in the daily life or with one arm tied behind their back in the assessment. So actually, the humans never look at the OCTs alone. They always have a retinal photograph, they have a visual acuity, they have some history. And so we repeated the exercise, giving all of that information. And indeed, that did improve the performance of the, the algorithm, of the humans. And the best human got down to the 5.5% error rate that the algorithm had using the OCT alone. And you may say, well, what did it get wrong? And the key thing that the BBC picked up on was AI did not miss a single urgent uh, case. And in fact, the ones that it had the wrong decision, when we looked at the reference standards, they were often very ambiguous, challenging cases. And a lot of the time, with the benefit of hindsight, we felt actually our algorithm has got the right answer and our reference standard diagnosis was wrong, or at least questionable. So my last slide then, where are we going with this? What are the next steps? Well, look. I'm as excited as the next person, probably as any of you here, about the potential of AI in healthcare. But I think it's really important that we mix that enthusiasm with the kind of cautious optimism, a certain skepticism about these things. Because I think that there's great potential, but there's also lots of ways it might not work. So we have to have robust clinical validation before we let this technology loosen patients. We're also doing a lot of projects now related to AI-assisted science. In particular, we think we can predict the future onset of macular degeneration six months ahead of schedule. And we think that ophthalmology will be the first medical specialty to be fundamentally transformed by the application of artificial intelligence. Lastly, it's hard to read. That's my email address. Uh, that's my Twitter handle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Piers. Thank you. Okay, finally, Jacqueline Moxon, who's going to talk about AI application in breast screening. Thank you. I can see that. Everyone here, good afternoon. Um, apparently, the trains are going to be on time this afternoon, so we'll try and whiz through this so you can actually hear what I'm saying. I'll move closer over to here. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, so um, 
slightly different slant. I work for MRAD, which is the East Midlands Radiology Consortium, and we are based uh, in the Midlands, and we have seven trusts along the bottom there that we are joined together. We are one of the test beds um, for this year, and we are working with four partners, Optimity as an evaluation partner, Chiron, Faculty, and GE Healthcare, who are our contractor. We are looking at using AI for breast screening. Um, so artificial intelligent breast screening as we are learning to support. Um, so we're trying to improve the capacity, improve um, patient care and the confidence. I think we've heard a lot today about patient and, and um, public confidence in AI. So what we're trying to do is more than just AI. Uh, on the right hand side there is quite a powerful picture of Dr. Liz O'Riordan who is actually one of our um, patient supporters. She's also a breast surgeon and has recurrent breast um, cancer. So we're looking at the engagement, the clinical feedback, the systems integration. So what we found to date, one of the problems is that we're working with legacy systems, trying to get the data out of the NHS and then trying to provide that data to our partners that we're working with, with them, with Faculty and Chiron. So it's been, it's been quite problematic, we're halfway through. So this, this is the real world. Um, how are we going to then expand it across the trust once we, we get to the end of the test bed? So we're at the stage at the moment, we have just provided de-identified data to Chiron, who are using their MIA tool, there's the train, uh, who are using their MIA tool to, um, to review that data and calibrate it. So it's going to be a couple of months um, before we get to the next stage, and that is uh, retrospective data. So as we go forward, we'll do the next stage, and we will have to have a trial. Um, so it is quite a lot of work, and I think sort of um, Pierce was saying there that we have to take it, you know, sort of a pinch of salt, really, with all, all of the hype that's going on. It's going to take a while to actually get all this data out there and get the eye working. Okay, so one of the big things is around the IG. Now, I would say probably a year ago before we started this project, IG is always seen as, as a barrier. Um, GDPR came on, it's, oh, we, we, can't give, we can't share our data. But in actual fact, you, ne you need to look at it from a different perspective. Why are we sharing the data? Are we sharing it appropriately? Are we following all the um, GDPR principles? And are we now following all the code, um, code of conduct that's coming in? So it, it's been problematic um, getting a head around what the suppliers actually wanted, what they were going to do with the data, who's got the intellectual properties of, of the, um, the algorithms to start with, and then afterwards, once we've actually done our testing, what are we going to do with the data again, who owns it? So we've, we've done quite a lot of work on that, and we're happy to talk to anybody um, who wants to work through that IG minefield with us. Um, so as we move forward now, it's about building clinical and patient support for this technology. Um, with, the, with the other partner that we're working with, faculty, we're looking at the operational aspect. So again, trying to use that data, and that involves staff data as well. So have we got the right people in the right place? So if we're going to produce this imaging data, get the ladies through the process a lot quicker, have we got the staff in place? So breast screening, just so if you're not aware, um, we're understaffed within um, breast screening by 20, 25% retirement. We've got a lot of vacancies. So it, 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 is, a, it is a big issue, and I, I'm, I'm sure radiology isn't um, alone. Um, all the other disciplines that we've talked about today over um, the course of the event. So as I said, it, we've got a padlock there. We've, we're just... We're on the threshold of providing data to the second AI company. Um, I would expect that in three years' time, when I go for my next breast screening, being in that age group, that as the second reader should be, and I hope it will be, AI. So we will still have the human element. I think everybody, that's what they're fearful of. Is there a human touch to all of this AI? So I think you, you need to expect that it's coming. If you're fearful of it, you need to get your head around it because it's going to happen in our generation. Um, but I say, as expected, that in three years' time, there will be a, a machine that will read one of my um, images and we'll have a human reader next to it. And I would expect when I go back in six years, it will be, you know, it's out there as a norm. 
So, thank you very much. Uh, I think we're going to hand over now. We're going to have some general questions. Thank you. Um, I am going to selfishly ask one question first, very, very quickly, and then we will get maybe one. Oh, we, got, we can get two from you guys, so have a think. My first question, very selfishly while I'm here, is, um, you know, as we are trying to support you, firstly, thank you for what you do. Brilliant to see everything that you've shown us today. Thank you, honestly, thank you, because it must be very, very difficult in the environment that exists at the moment to persist so thank you for doing that. If there was one thing that we at the centre, NHSX, could do to kind of make your lives easier and make it easier for others like you, what would that be? You're going to need a microphone. Go ahead, Nick. Um, from my perspective, it's bringing together all of the different governance processes, regulations, you know, codes of conduct is, is starting to do that because we try to map out, you know, if we start a, a data-driven innovation project, what are all of the different requirements of that and what do we have to consider? And, we, and you know, it's, it's, it's a big piece of work in terms of trying to look at an easy toolkit to say, right, as a, as a startup company or even a, a, as a trust, what, things do, what boxes do we need to tick and what we need to be considering at the beginning of a project? Brilliant. Can, um, so I would, I would, I would add to that. I would ag totally agree with that. I would say clarity about um, what the rules are, and particular in relation to information governance. It's like you want to do the best possible job uh, with regard to information governance. You, if you were reading an article about your research in a newspaper, you would want to feel confident that the people had done the right thing. And the problem, the reason why information governance is a challenge is not because people want to take shortcuts, it's because there's lack of clarity about what you can do. And oftentimes you encounter this thing where people just don't know and they just go GDPR, yeah. GDPR, and, they, and then you go, well, why is that an issue? Can you just pin, like, what's the specific thing we have to do, deal with? And they just go, no, GDPR, and, that, and then yeah. you have to deal with that. And oftentimes, you, you're in a cycle, and I'm sure you guys can relate to it, where you arrange a meeting, and you have like this meeting with someone, nothing happens, two months have passed, six months have passed, and at the end of, at the end of six months, or the end of a year, or maybe never, you just realize actually it was something simple and we just wasted six months and actually just some, if someone who knew what they were talking about had told us the right thing at the start, no problems. Brilliant. Thank you. Okay, okay. do you want to say Yeah, sure. Um, so I think I might have. Yeah, so I, th I think like um, Nick can probably add to this, but I th with what we're doing, you know, the, the initial stages, uh, you know, at the sort of stockholding unit level, so it's not really engaging with the hospitals, but in the second phase as we're engaging with hospitals, I think, you know, we found some, some NHS trusts that are really excited to work with us, and that's really great, but I think, you know, doing the broader rollout is going to be a challenge, and if NHSX was able to assist with that, I think that'd be really great. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Okay, um, so a couple of questions from the audience. Man at the back had his hand up very early. Uh, you might need to shout quite loud if that's okay. I don't think we have a mic. Thanks. Hi, my name is Amelia from the Autism and Child Psychiatrist and Digital Innovation Leader at Telescope in Portland. So, you know, very similar Okay, well, NHSX thinks that's very interesting, but I suppose you're asking um, the panel, would it have helped or do, do you need help in un if, if, if we were interested in those co-creation models uh, or something? Yeah, so I suppose from our point of view, we're in the fortunate position that because we're Innovate UK funded, we have to have a collaboration agreement between ourselves, between the different parties, which includes sort of, for want of a better word, kickback to NHSBT for our involvement in it. I think I'd put the question back to the companies that want to work with the NHS 
And actually, they need to be aware that it's not just about getting the data and providing a product. There has to be some benefit to the NHS, be that, and some of that has to be, I think, financial. Yeah, I mean, and, yeah, and I think NHS is very interested in that. We are exploring what that means. A bit to Piers' point, we, you know, commercial for us generally means buying stuff. So we have lots of commercial people who are good at, you know, or good, but you work on buying stuff. We probably need to think about, you know, new commercial models, and we are, but that is very interesting. And if, if you think it would help, then that helps us. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've started to look at a lot of different uh, kind of collaboration models, and I think also taking a lot from, from industry in terms of innovation and how new ways of working and open innovation was quite new in industry, and, and we experienced the same thing within the NHS, and we can learn a lot from that, where actually it has to be a win-win partnership, and it, it's not just about... Um, you know, the, the, the companies um, getting the benefit, there has to be f feedback into the NHS as well. Okay, I'm being told no more questions, but um, if anyone's got one quick question with it, that, with, that would be get a quick answer and I'll get told off afterwards. Okay, the gentleman there. That's a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> There's no short answers in that one. Okay, so one word answer. NHS on the table in trade deals. One word answer, yes or no? I try not to listen to too much of what Donald Trump says. <laughs> Is that a no? No, that's my answer. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, listen, thank you very much to our panelists. That was really interesting. Thank you for your time and thank you for doing what you do. Keep going. Thank you.